the Senior Hour, which is sponsored by Camp Com- Keepers in Comfort Keepers in Home Care and Advanced Audiology. I'm Barbara Cochran with my co-host, Dr. Jean Dorio, on your hometown station KHTS. This is a show for, about, and by seniors, giving information to enhance one's quality of life. And our in-studio guest this morning is Dr. Benjamin Leach from the City of Hope, and you are an oncologist. And what was the other? Hematologist. Yes. Therapeutics, <laughs> medical oncology and therapeutics research. That's and you correct. have this lovely lady, Hello. your assistant. <laughs> I am Amanda Eggleseeder, and I'm the physician relations liaison in yes. Mission Hills, Santa Clarita, and Simi Valley. You're a busy little lady, aren't I you? I am. A lot of freeway therapy. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, at yeah. least that keeps you alert, doesn't it? Does. it? <laughs> and you know you have to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> exactly. Right. Absolutely. And Happy New Year to all our listeners. Yes. Happy New Year. Happy yeah. New Year. Good heavens, another year has <coughs> gone. Mm-hmm. Where did it go? <laughs> I mean, it completely disappeared. Yeah. I can't believe it. It's 2018. Good heavens. Mm-hmm. Goes by real fast. Oh, it does very but fast. For some of our seniors, it se- seems even faster. I bet. I, uh, well, it does me, yeah. <laughs> but that's all right. Last year was a good year, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. this year will be an even better year, right? That's, that's right. Everybody in agreement? Yep. Absolutely. Oh, and good, for good, those good. who are listening um, later today at uh, one o'clock at the senior center, I'll be speaking on achieving good health 2018. So you're welcome to come. It's free. So uh, make your way over there. It's on Market Street. So. Um, you know, we'll talk about different issues, almost all related to aging and what you can do about it. Not turn the clock back. No, no, but, no, no. But no. what you can do about it. That sounds very interesting. <coughs> nice. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. And we have a lot of lovely seniors mm-hmm. at the senior center. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Gives, uh, gives our seniors here in Santa Clarita a place to go. It to, absolutely uh, does. To... Uh, succeed and then their passion of trying to find that quality of life that they they uh, are trying to um, make sure they achieve and 2018 I think will be a better year for them we're gonna try to see uh, what we can do in terms of uh, enhancing their quality of life on this radio show from this station uh, and at the senior center that's right so and speaking of quality of life speaking yes of which, yes, <laughs> yes. Dr. Leach? Yes, some very yes. important uh, topics. I think um, for me, medical oncology is a very important um, field for, for seniors um, to think about. As we know, the, as, as we age, our, our risk of developing um, cancer, unfortunately, does go up. And mm-hmm. so it's something to be, um, to be v- very aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that you, you see patients... Um, at home, I believe I, I do heard. house calls. Yeah, yes, I do house calls, yeah. and you know it helps. But you know, Ben, the the big thing about cancer is it does sneak up on you, and uh, the best part about the human body is that it will tell you sometimes and give you symptoms of something wrong. And there's some uh, what we call constitutional symptoms that people will get, uh, and we can go over those things because I think are. Our listeners, you know, uh, some of their uh, problems blend in with aging and, you know, and Mm -hmm. sometimes with illness. And we have to be able to define the difference between the two and allow our seniors to understand that when they need to seek help. That's right. That's right. I think um, some of the some of those symptoms that I commonly see are things like um, loss of appetite uh, or uh, in conjunction with that weight loss. And some of those things can be maybe expected as we do get older, but some of them also may be sort of red flags of something else mm-hmm. going on. So it is important, I think, when you do feel that maybe something's changed about your diet or, or your weight, weight loss is developing, that you maybe talk with your doctor about it um, so you can get a sense of um, what's going on. And they, I think, then can sort of, you can have your weights followed, you can mm-hmm. measure what your diet has been, you can work with a nutritionist. There's a number of things to investigate, to see, and try and understand whether those are maybe playing into something that could be unfortunately more insidious development of a problem or mm-hmm. if it's in fact just the actual normal part of aging All right and when you see blood i mean that that's that's a, a a big signal that says blood in the stool blood in the urine uh, that's a problem i mean we have people who lose their appetite who lose weight 
Uh, but when you start seeing manifestations of something that's going on, you better act on it. And, you know, sometimes it's not, uh, especially our senior guys, you know, they don't tend to uh, <laughs> sure. act on a lot of things. But, uh, you know, there are others around the uh, spouses and caregivers that will also recognize problems and will br- try to bring it to the attention of the patient themselves. But, mm-hmm. you know, heeding that the the life's warnings of what the body is saying is, is, is pretty important. And, you know, further testing and going to a physician, a primary care physician, whether they do house calls or you go to their office, you know, that, that's a key point of all of this. That's the biggest stepping stone that, and the rate determining step of uh, how the patient will do. Remember that um, even 20, 25 years ago, if you got cancer, you know, your chance of survival was not real good. But, you True. know, I think it's at least now you get cancer, there's at least a two-thirds chance of you surviving. And, of course, it depends on what it is. That's right. You know, some That's of the skin right. cancers are are pretty benign cancers. And then there's the one of the worst cancers is a skin cancer and could, could uh, lead to your death. So acting upon what your body is trying to say to you is, is really important, Ben, isn't it? I totally agree. And I think, um, especially piggybacking off what you're talking about, having maybe finding blood in an area that shouldn't be, or finding blood mm-hmm. when you go to the bathroom, is in a, can be a very important sign of mm-hmm. precancerous lesions, in mm-hmm. fact. And so... Um, I uh, spent a lot of time in my training um, doing research on colon cancer, Mm -hmm. Um, and we know from research that colon cancer does develop in a stepwise fashion. It does develop with precancerous lesions, or what many of us know as polyps. Polyps. We've probably heard polyps polyps before. Um, Those often are the pre, sort of pre-lesion, the defining lesion that ultimately then may turn into a cancer, and it doesn't always, but you may have a signal that you have some polyps when you begin to notice blood in your stool, for example. And so that could be a sign for a time to see a gastroenterologist, to have a colonoscopy. And those can actually be removed and thereby preventing Mm -hmm. a potential development of something down the line. And so I think it's really important um, that that people are aware of those those symptoms and communicate openly with their doctor or or their family or have, have their family members um, communicate openly with the doctors so that we can nip, nip those things in the bud before they take off and potentially develop into something more dangerous. That's, that's true. And normally, I, at least I was having um, those tests every 10 years. Mm-hmm. And at one point, they discovered polyps. And now I have to go in every five years to make sure that everything is okay. Right. And Mm -hmm. another thing that um, we're talking about, getting cancer, a lot of our medications that seniors take, one of the side effects is possible cancer. And I think everyone has to be on the lookout for that. Mm -hmm. I know because I experienced it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you were medication. you were doing well, and you were on medication for quite a few years, and uh, then you started getting symptoms, and your physician, Dr. Felix Barte, recognized something was wrong, and you know he jumped on that right mm-hmm. away, and uh, because you did heed the warning signs uh, and said this is not normal for me. Uh, you move forward, and you know you're here today, and absolutely, cured. absolutely. Going on six years. Mm-hmm. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Celebration. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> and we do some of the medications, like Barbara, you say, they are they are helpful to for certain entities, but then they also are toxic That's right. to the body. That's right. And the body is not used to that. And you know, we're fed the idea that, you know, you you need to you know, be very normal. And that's great that you are. But the bad part is that in trying to achieve that normalcy, you're going to be, you might take some things that end up uh, having an adverse effect on you. And patients don't know. The best part is when you, and when you're watching TV in the evening time and whatever whatever channel you watch evening news, every commercial is a, a drug commercial. That's right. From the pharmaceutical companies. And it's interesting because they have to detail the 
problems and the side effects of their medications. And they'll say, this is great stuff. This is super. Bah, 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 bah. Underneath, under their breath, they're going, bah, 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 bah. and they'll have all these little things under the screen that are warning you about the potential problems with it, like Barbara, you had. That's right. And it, it didn't always occur like that. They didn't, all, they, didn't, they didn't used to say, and a possible side effect may be. Right. It's only been in the last, what, five, seven years that they have, I guess they've been required to think, mention that. I think they've started to, to understand that many, many of the drugs, I think especially the class of drugs that you're referring to, are drugs that are um, suppressing our immune, immune system. system. Mm -hmm. That's We've correct. only recently discovered that our own immune system is somehow able to keep some cancers at bay. And so when we suppress it, maybe to help a different disease, an autoimmune disease, mm -hmm. it can allow a, a cancer to develop. Um, and that's been something that, that, that doctors are, that we're learning, um, as you say, just, just recently. And um, I think it's amazing that you, you went through that experience and have survived and um, it's really a testament to having an important, a close relationship with your physician so that they can be aware that something's wrong and that you're able to speak to them about, about something and it's being also, wrong. And it's also very important to know your body. Yes. Pay attention to what your body is saying because your body speaks very loud and very clear. Yes. Hey, something's wrong. Go check it out. That's I right. think that's very, very important. That's and do right. we need to take a break? Mm -hmm. I think we do. I'm Barbara Cochran with my co-host, Dr. Jean Dorio, on your hometown station, KHTS. Drugs or alcohol abuse can tear a family apart. In Santa Clarita, just like everywhere else, it's an epidemic. The Way Out Recovery is here to help. Call them now at 296-4444 or visit them on the web at thewayoutrecoveryscv.com. The Way Out offers outpatient treatment for adolescents, adults, and family members. The Way Out is compassionate, caring, professional, and confidential. You and your family don't have to suffer any longer. Call The Way Out Recovery now, 296-4444, or visit thewayoutrecoveryscv.com and make an appointment. Asking for help is the first step. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one Advanced Audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. There are many memorable restaurants in Santa Clarita, but three words stand out from the crowd. Mom can cook. Mama puede cocinar. Mom can cook the best Thai food on this side of the planet. Mama fe la cuisine. No matter what language you use, Mom can cook says it all. Thai food at its finest. All your favorite dishes and Mom's very own original specialties. Experience it on Soledad by the Canyon Country Post Office. Mama Lloriga Jostesio. Mom can cook. Hi, Kirk Stinson here with Plumbing by Kirk, your hometown plumber. With another tip, close your sink drain and remove your expensive jewelry when entering the shower to avoid costly plumbing expenses. But if it does happen, shut off the water immediately and call Plumbing by Kirk. We invite you to visit our website for free plumbing advice at plumbingbykirk.com or give us a call, 263-6519. That's 263-6519. My dad is the best plumber ever. Call Plumbing by Kirk. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one Advanced Audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. Your, your hometown station. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Welcome back to the Senior Hour. I'm Dr. Gene Dorio with my co-host, Barbara Cochran, on your hometown station. AM 1220 KHTS. No, 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 no. That's a naughty. <laughs> we're, 
And we're talking to uh, Benjamin Leach from um, City of Hope Hello. about uh, uh, hematology and oncology, in other words, cancer. And, you know, Ben, our, our, our patients uh, fear cancer. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the ways that we can not get around it, but to stave it off and fight it off is to make sure that not only, like we said earlier, heed the warnings of what your body is saying, but also there's testing, preventive testing That's that we right. can do uh, for our patients. You mentioned colonoscopies, and I think that is a, that is a, um, a valuable test. Very I mean, I, I cannot tell you how many lives of my patients have been saved because they got a colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And I, I can tell you that I've heard of some cases where they did not get a colonoscopy and they died. So colonoscopy, let's, let's start with that because I think that, you know, every, every one of these tests that we will talk about has guidelines as to when you should do it. But I think, you know, City of Hope has been a specialty, specialty hospital that is recognized around the world for their reputation and their input. And I'm counting on you, Ben, to be able to help the, our listeners today get an idea of when they might need a colonoscopy. Right, right. <clears throat> I think that um, denial can be a powerful force, and being mm -hmm. scared about what might be going on with you can be a very powerful force. Yeah. But I'll just sort of to echo what, you, what you've said is I've had some patients as well who I feel that had they gone earlier to do some of the screening tests, we may have been able to catch their cancer earlier and maybe even cure them uh, mm -hmm. rather than go down another route. So it's, it is sometimes challenging and it is sometimes scary to go through some of these tests, especially some that are uncomfortable. But mm -hmm. we, there's a reason that we do recommend them and they really do help to uh, prevent um, you know, a lot of early deaths from cancer. And so I think um, colonoscopy, as we mentioned, is a, is a really critically important one. And I think most national guidelines, I know we're talking mostly to seniors, but I think just to sort of give you a broad overview about the recommendations for colonoscopy is pretty much most national guidelines recommend you start having a colonoscopy at age 50 at the absolute latest. Um, now, if you do have a family history of colon cancer, then typically they often recommend that you have your, your uh, colonoscopy 10 years before whenever that person was diagnosed with colon cancer. So, for example, mm -hmm. if somebody was diagnosed at 45, that may mean that you start in your mid-30s even beginning to have colonoscopies, depending on the relationship in your family, say if it was a mother or a father. More extended relationship might not meet that exact criteria. And as always, it should be a very open discussion with your primary care physician um, in conjunction with perhaps a geneticist if someone else has been diagnosed in your family, because that can really help us to try and understand, is there a genetic component and mm -hmm. something that we need to be a little more aware of? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of on the, the front end of the guidelines, where we, we were just talking a little bit about at the back end, how long do you do colonoscopies for? You know, mm -hmm. do 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 we do them until you're 75, till you're 85, till you're 95? And that has to be a very personalized discussion with patients. I think that most gu guideline bodies don't say stop at this age. Mm -hmm. And I think many people feel that once they get to a certain age, they no longer le need the screening test. But we tend to think of age more as a functional number. What mm -hmm. are you functionally at? Are you an 85-year-old who's doing well, who's, who's carrying out all your activities to, of daily living, well, then maybe you should still be uh, going by these guidelines and having some of these screening tests done. Um, but it does have to be a very personalized discussion with your physician to try and understand whether there's some value there, if that, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yes, yeah. it does. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing with our patients, value, I want to make sure our listeners know, is not related that it's costing the company, especially in HMO, more money. Value is your value of your life and your quality of life. And, 
You know, there are many of our patients now who are in their 80s and even in their 90s who have sustained themselves by not drinking, not smoking, exercising, taking care of themselves. And then at 85 years old, they're being told, no, no, you're not going to get any more colonoscopies because it's not of value. Well, you know, that is, as you were saying, Ben, that is something that needs to be decided by the doctor and the patient, but sometimes that could be skewed by the background of the doctor and where they're working and what they're being told. And I've seen that uh, constantly, and I don't like that in our medical system. And, you know, I, I have qualms across the board, as people know, about our life expectancy in this country has diminished two years in a row now and why that is occurring, because I think the word denial of care has uh, uh, happened in this country, and it's because of the, of the ongoing costs and profit from some of these uh, uh, people that are providing care. So getting away from that and going back to the colonoscopies, right. and uh, but let's let's talk a little bit about the mammogram because that is always a, a very more, confusing. It's very confusing yes. and yes. very <laughs> upsetting by those who uh, might have a history of uh, uh, breast cancer in the family, those right. who might have a diagnosis of dense dense breasts. Uh, those who find a lump and are concerned about it. Right. Let, let's go through mammograms and the preventive tests that we, sure. uh, and guidelines that are out there or the, the blending of the guidelines. In some ways, um, the guidelines about mammograms are similar to colonoscopy in that if you do have a family history of breast cancer, it should then induce you into having a mammogram right. earlier than what the recommended guideline is. At this point, the recommended guidelines do differ among the various bodies. You know, there's the United States Pre Preventative Services Task Force mm -hmm. uh, who issues guidelines. There's, of course, the, um, the uh, American Cancer Society. There's mm -hmm. a number of bodies that release guidelines. Mm -hmm. The general consensus is around 40 women start having mammograms, although there's been a lot of debate and controversy about whether that's too late, too early, whether for a particular woman that should be um, also include an MRI. For example, you had mentioned women mm -hmm. with dense breasts. How do, you, how do we interpret those, whether an ultrasound should be involved? So again, it's a personalized decision that has to be undertaken with your primary care doctor, and I think it has to be undertaken in a way that's very open and honest relationship, where if you do find something concerning, you should bring it to the attention of your doctor. It may very well be a benign, benign mass or lump, but it's better to know early rather than to, to sort of um, ignore it and find out later that it might be something bad. So that's the front end of it. Now, the back end, <coughs> as far as age, again, the guidelines aren't very straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when you get into your late 60s, early 70s, you may really start to think about, do I really need to continue doing mammograms? And the, I think it can be taken into the context of family, of uh, in that genetics, it should be taken into the context of whether you've had prior abnormal mammograms. So there's a number of things that really you have to think about. Mm -hmm. My my fear, I think, with people reading in the lay press about these guidelines is mm -hmm. they use that as an opportunity to not have a test done or not have one of these things done, when in reality it should really be a discussion with your doctor about Absolutely. am I one of the people that falls mm -hmm. into this criteria or should I continue to have this type of testing done. Is kind of That's my concern with some of the lay press that shows... Um, what these guidelines are. And realize the guidelines are based on statistics. That's correct. And these statistics uh, go by standard deviations, and um, these numbers can, uh, you know, standard deviations and the bell-shaped curve, you know, you could be right in the middle like most other people, but you could be at the edges too. And, you know, those edge persons are people that sometimes end up having problems. And or they just make the excuse that they're not going to have a have testing done. So there's a lot of gray zones in for mammograms, and you know I still highly recommend them because I have had senior women over 85, over 85, and, and you know my mom is just a perfect example. You know she 
had breast cancer twice. Wow. And she had lump, and the first time was in 84 when she, the, the studies were just coming out in the New England Journal uh, having lumpectomies. And my oh, mom sure. had a lumpectomy at that time, and she was cured of it. And then when she was 90, she had another breast cancer that they found, and they took it out, and she did fine from that, uh, another lumpectomy. So she survived both of those, but unchallenged, she probably would have died. So the fact is she was getting her usual uh, mammograms even uh, at the age of 90 in an HMO, uh, and she did she did fine, but you know her h m o is just one that is not going to chintz people like some others might, and you know that once again is a different topic but right. and and then go you know there are there are another controversial uh cancer for our men is prostate cancer yes. and using uh you know we do uh ultrasounds we do p s a s uh lab tests on patients and you know, this this it's a hard, harder um, cancer to find as well. And not only is it harder to find, sometimes it's also the question is, what do you do about it? That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. We're we're moving on the spectrum here from mm-hmm. these cancers of I think what's more defined with colon cancer, and then moving to breast and prostate, it's much more ill-defined. Mm-hmm. What do we do as physicians, and what should we do as patients? Um, what should we expect from our doctor? And one of the questions is about the PSA test. Mm-hmm. Um, the PSA <laughs> test is is like a it has been like a fad to some degree. It falls uh-huh. in and out of favor, and I think uh-huh. the pendulum is sort of swinging back. Um, but again, it's a test that can help to identify men with prostate cancer. We know that it it can help to identify men with prostate cancer. We know that there's many false positives with the with the PSA test. Um, men with um, an enlarged prostate can have a false positive PSA test. Mm-hmm. And so we know that sometimes it can lead to unnecessary biopsies and complications. But we also know that it can help identify men with cancer. <laughs> and so it's a very, very difficult, again, I keep saying personalized discussion, but I can't emphasize that enough, having a personalized dis- discussion with your doctor and not making an assumption because of something you may have read or heard from someone because everybody's situation is different. And everyone should have that discussion about their own context with their doctor. Um, I can tell you that for African-American men or men who have prostate cancer in their family, the likelihood of developing prostate cancer is a little bit higher. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I think that most most physicians would recommend doing PSA screening in those men. I'm not sure for you if that's uh, sort of how you abide in your, mm-hmm. your own practice. Uh, but at the very least, those, those are men that should really be undergoing screening. Absolutely. And of all the gentlemen who, who had a false positive on their PSA of every single one of my patients for 37 years and all this time, when they went through it and they found no cancer, every single one of my patients have said, I'm glad I went through it. Uh, And it Mm -hmm. wasn't, oh, I went uh, undo testing and extra costs or anything like that. What they derived from it was peace of mind. That's right. And because they did, you know, they were satisfied and happy. False alarm, but they were okay with it. So I know the medical profession will tout, oh, unnecessary testing. And, you know, we're sensitive to that because it costs money. And people will say, oh, you did it for the money. Right. And, you know, I don't know my, any of my colleagues that would do anything like that. But, you know, the accusations are made. But, you know, these these testings, you know, can lead you down a path that, doesn't lead to cancer, but they're all okay with it and they're fine with it. Right. So let's talk about another one that became kind of a fad in the past was, is ovarian cancer because we used to get something called CA-125. Right. Right. And we used to order ultrasounds of the ovaries a a lot. Uh, And, you know, but there are still women who get ovarian cancer and die from ovarian cancer because, you know, we do now 
uh, I guess it's, it's microsurgery, yeah. uh, and can help many of those who have late stage ovarian cancer, but still it's a, it's a nemesis and it's out there and it's, you know, truly one of those, um, cancers that is, is difficult, very difficult to make a diagnosis. That's right. Well, it's, it's interesting because in both of these areas, breast cancer and ovarian cancer, when I had my children, I was breastfeeding and I got an infection mm-hmm. and the doctor said, stop right away. And I did stop. And after three children, about four or five years later, I had a lumpectomy and then I had another lumpectomy. And then, of course, later on, I had problems with my ovaries, and the doctor said, get, get them out. Get mm-hmm. them out. You do not want to take the chance. And, of course, with the, um, the mammograms, I go religiously to have the mammograms. I've always done that because of that incident arising from, and I, the doctor didn't know at that time whether it was was an infection or what it was from breastfeeding. But it was something that was, okay, right in the forefront. Take care of it. Take care of it. That's right. And so far, so good. <laughs> Thank God. Thank Absolutely. God, of course. There's, there is an important connection between breast and ovarian cancer, and we know that, that it's uh, obviously estrogen-fueled. This is sort mm-hmm. of the female hormone. Mm-hmm. But, of course, there's a number of genetics uh, that can lead to an increased risk of developing cancer, um, breast or ovarian, and one is the BRCA gene. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, we've, I think, over the years, even in the last five to ten years, there's been a lot of new understanding about what genetic problems may lead to a higher predisposition for developing both of those cancers. Mm -hmm. And that really can guide us in saying, you know what, you had breast cancer, we caught it early, but let's be safe, and maybe you do do need to have your ovaries removed, or maybe you do need to have a screening test. I don't think the screening tests for ovarian cancer are applicable to a general population now, but for some high-risk situations, it might be a, a good option. I would agree. I, I think mm-hmm. every woman needs to have a mammogram, whether they've had any any kind of experience or not. It's mm-hmm. just not worth taking the risk mm-hmm. because right. it can happen. And then when and you I, and when you have genetic testing after that, then the genetic testing uh, reveals that you have higher uh, a, a higher possibility of having another kind of cancer. You know that presentation is one of these that go between the doctor and the patient. Some people say, I'm, I still want to have children. I'm not going to take my ovaries out. Uh, no, I don't want to take my breasts off uh, because, you know, that's not natural. You know, so you have a lot of arguments and people from different, with different sensitivities about doing these things. But, you know, you're hearing a lot of times women who will come out and they'll say, yeah, I had this cancer and I had to uh, also have a uh, mastectomy done or uh, the ovaries taken out and things like that. And I think that discussion is out there so that everybody can hear it. And, right. you know, and it is up to the individual. And you, once again, we go to statistics and rolling the dice. Um, you know, that's a decision that each one of us has to make. We walk out of our building here or get in the car and drive. You know, statistically, there's a chance that we might not make it home, but it's a chance that we take. And that's the same with life in general and cancers in general. And I think most, most men do not want to follow through. With women, it's completely different. I completely uh, agree with you. <laughs> absolutely. You know, no, I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need to go to the doctor. And most men don't. They it's really true. don't. It's and true. then at some point, uh-oh, something's wrong. Right. You know, right. And, and a lot of times, even when there is something wrong, oh, nothing wrong with me. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. And I think that that is very true with most <clears throat> men. They it's do not want to admit that something is wrong with them. I don't know what it is about that thought or anything, but it's very foolish in my opinion. Well, it's the same thing you know? with men not, even, not wanting to ask for directions. 
Well, I guess that's true. DNA will show that it's genetically related. <laughs> it definitely is. It definitely is. That's, so, that's really funny. So we're talking with Dr. Benjamin Leach from City of Hope, and we're going to be back in a few minutes. Uh, but I'd like to, you know, at that time talk about the more difficult cancers that are out there. We'll only have like three or four minutes to do that, but there are some that are there that men try to avoid and hope to avoid, and, you know, everybody will try to avoid and hope to avoid. So uh, we're on uh, the Senior Hour on your hometown station, KHTS. Lots of people can build websites, even your sister-in-law's cousin. But there's one Santa Clarita company that specializes in designing websites for your business, Small Dog Creative. The Small Dog Creative team are local designers who are hands-on. Their talented team of experts build premium websites and redefine branding. Small Dog Creative doesn't just build websites, they'll upgrade your business's online presence and turn your business into a powerful online brand. Small Dog Creative, Santa Clarita's most innovative web and design company. SmallDogCreative.com My favorite restaurant in Santa Clarita? Salt Creek Grill, of course. Great food, neat atmosphere. For a business lunch or romantic dinner, I'll always go to Salt Creek. Hi, I'm Greg Amsler, owner of Salt Creek Grill. We have created Salt Creek to provide you with the most comfortable and inviting restaurant in Santa Clarita. Enjoy fresh mesquite grilled fish, aged steaks, and the best chops imaginable. There's entertainment every Friday and Saturday night, and we have the best Sunday brunch in town. Salt Creek is on Town Center Drive in Valencia. The Santa Clarita Artists Association has a new gallery in downtown Newhall on 6th Street between Main and Railroad, right across from the Canyon Theater Guild. The gallery features our members' paintings, sculptures, and one-of-a-kind handcrafted gift items. Whether you're an art lover, buyer, or an artist wishing to join, visit our website at santaclaritaartist.org, come to our free monthly meetings at Barnes & Noble, or stop by the gallery. For upcoming events and exhibits, check us out at santaclaritaartist.org. We make visual art visible. At Advanced Audiology, we know how important hearing is to you, your loved ones, your work success, your safety, and your ability to stay in the game. Most people won't admit hearing loss to themselves or others. We make it easy for you. Today's digital hearing aids come in a variety of styles, including invisible. All feature-rich, providing unparalleled hearing quality, wearing comfort, and automation that simplifies your life. Don't be fooled by our imitators. There's only one Advanced Audiology with the purple sign next to AAA on Valencia Boulevard. Hometown. They're amazing and every single one of their songs is amazing. Except for like one. Your hometown station. Will you still need me? Will you still feed me? When I'm 64. Welcome back to the Senior Hour. I'm Barbara Carkin with my co-host, Dr. Jean Dorio, on your hometown station, KHTS. And we're speaking with Dr. Benjamin Leach, who is an oncologist and with the City of Hope and also... His companion there, Amanda, how are you? Good. Good. It's good to see you again. And we're going to be talking about... Some of the difficult uh, right. cancers that right. that are, um, you know, are out there. And, you know, people, they, they uh, get pancreatic cancer uh, and they die. Mm-hmm. They get skin cancers like melanoma. They die. Uh, brain tumors, and we're having a little bit more success, but brain tumors, most, many of them die. Uh, these are difficult cancers that um, when they finally um, manifest with symptoms, you know, sometimes it's too late. That's right. That's right. I can tell you as, a, as an oncologist, it can be um, some of the most challenging um, times is, is seeing patients with these types of cancers. Um, they're recalcitrant, recalcitrant to many treatments. Um, they can manifest uh, because of some of the locations with some uh, pretty bad symptoms. And so it's hard, hard to talk about. And I think, um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have screening tests for these types of cancers. We are, we can be aware of symptoms and we should be, again, as we re- mentioned earlier, sort of reiterate, we should be communicating, have an open line of communication with our doctors about um, any new symptoms, but we don't have a good screening test for pancreas cancer. We don't. And that is a very, very fast-moving cancer, it pancreatic can be. cancer. Mm-hmm. Can be, yeah. I've had two friends who have discovered they have pancreatic cancer, and they were gone in less than six months. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. One of the difficulties with pancreas cancer is by the time many people begin to feel symptomatic from the mm-hmm. cancer, it's already too late. And since Absolutely. we don't have that screening test available, 
it can be it can be a really devastating uh, devastating cancer. I think that um, these are cancers where it's important to work with your oncologist, talk with your family, mm -hmm. and a palliative care specialist about your what your goals are as far as treatment, because some of the treatments can be um, pretty intense, but without much benefit. And I think that these are times when it's important to have that open line communication and thinking about how you want the next six months to a year of your life to be, what, how you want to face treatment. And um, mm -hmm. for some people, that may mean really going hard at the treatment and really having intensive <clears throat> chemotherapy. And for others, it might mean um, enjoying time with family and maybe not doing such an intense treatment. And that has to be, again, a very personalized discussion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. decision. Don't you think, Ben, it's hard, though, when you have especially children who have uh, blood cancers or brain tumors and trying to deal with them? I mean, I, I, I did, you know, everybody said I should have done pediatrics, and here <laughs> I went to the other side of the spectrum and did geriatrics. Um, <laughs> But the reason why I didn't do pediatrics was because, you know, in the pediatric intensive care unit, in the emergency room, you know, I, you see kids and they don't make it. That was, to me, at even a young age in, in my career was something I couldn't do. I realized I'm not going to be there, but for you as an oncologist, you know, I, I just, I admire you for being in that field because I, could, I couldn't do it. Well, I do. I have to admit, I don't treat pediatric patients at oh, all. There you go. It's for it's the same smart, reason. Smart. It's for the same reason that it's. Um, it can be tremendously sad and difficult, and it and um, you know it is a very different context where you have to make decisions for somebody that maybe doesn't fully understand the decisions, and you might even have to push them to take chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, children with leukemia often can be cured. Uh, mm -hmm. But they do have to go through very rigorous treatment, and that can be yep. very trying for for both the child, but really for the for the parents of, yep. of the child. Parents suffer. Um, so so, and the, um, the the doctors and the nurses suffer too when you that's right. because it's so long term the treatment you get to know the kids or personalities and yeah, like I said, I couldn't do it. It was just uh, too hard on me, and that Same. was something that I just said. Um, that can't be in my repertoire of life because that's going to make me old too fast. Yes, I, I agree with you, and the more power to the people that are able to do that. I think it's a really amazing, the people that feel that calling, that, that are doing pediatric oncology yeah. and are able to commit to that. In, in our last minute, let's talk real quick about skin cancer because, like I say, on, on the, the prism of where things go in skin cancers, a lot of them are just benign. You remove them, you excise them, but the malignant melanoma is a difficult one. And our seniors are listening. They're saying, well, I got this little bump here. I got this little skin thing. It's changing. I mean, what should they look for in a, in just in a real capsule here? Yeah, great question. Um, for melanomas, we really worry about whether you have a mole that is changing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the really most basic way to think about it. If you have an established mole or a new mole that develops and is changing in any way, and whether that means the border, the color, um, the size, all these, all these different attributes of it, mm -hmm. that would be a time to bring it up to your doctor because it would mm -hmm. be so much easier then for a dermatologist to biopsy it or remove it before you let it grow and get out of control. So those are the things that any change in a mole that you have established, all you have to do is bring up to your doctor who can then take a look at it and, mm -hmm. and would be help, able to help sort of decide whether it's something that needs to be looked at by a specialist. And, and nowadays with our technology and our you know, cell phone cameras, you can take a picture of it. So, you, you know, if loved point. ones are, are listening right now, you know, if you're, you're, your mother or father or whoever, your, your friend, they're saying, hey, this is a little unusual. Take a picture of it right away because, of course, if they mull over it and don't do anything about it, at least you'll have a picture and you'll be able to say, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, uh, two months ago it looked like this and now it looks like this. You know, it could, you know, change their whole life in terms of making them motivated to do something about it. That's a great yes. recommendation. Yes. I completely agree. It is. Well, yeah. Dr. Leach uh, just had a great conversation here that went over a lot of things uh, uh, with uh, that our you know, in your in your venue and your field that you do, and City of Hope has always been out there to 
uh, help us in the world internationally and in this country, but now we have it here in Santa Clarita. And your your office is, uh, happens to be uh, across from my office in the building at 23823 um, uh, Valencia Boulevard, uh, and it's across from City Hall. And you, you're, the fact that City of Hope is here right now has made a huge difference, I think, to this community. So welcome. Thanks Thank for being so here. We appreciate both of you being here today and giving our seniors a, a better understanding of uh, what to look for in terms of uh, cancers and other problems that they might have. Uh, we are sponsored by Advanced Audiology and Comfort Keepers in Home Care. Listen to us next week on the Senior Hour. Now go and enhance your quality of life.